The Analysis of Mind. Produced by Diane Bean. The Analysis of Mind. By Bertrand Russell. 1921. Muirhead Library of Philosophy. An admirable statement of the aims of the Library of Philosophy was provided by the first editor, the late Professor J. H. Muirhead, in his description of the original program printed in Erdman's History of Philosophy under the date 1890. This was slightly modified in subsequent volumes to take the form of the following statement. The Muirhead Library of Philosophy was designed as a contribution to the history of modern philosophy under the heads, first of different schools of thought sensationalist, realist, idealist, intuitivist. Secondly of different subjects psychology, ethics, aesthetics, political philosophy, theology. While much had been done in England in tracing the course of evolution in nature, history, economics, morals, and religion, little had been done in tracing the development of thought on these subjects. Yet, the evolution of opinion is part of the whole evolution. By the cooperation of different writers in carrying out this plan, it was hoped that a thoroughness and completeness of treatment, otherwise unattainable, might be secured. It was believed also that from writers, mainly British and American fuller consideration of English philosophy, than it had hitherto received might be looked for. In the earlier series, of books containing, among others, Bosanke's History of Aesthetic, Flyderer's Rational Theology since Kant, Alvey's History of English, Utilitarianism, Bonar's Philosophy and Political Economy, Brett's History of Psychology, Ritchie's Natural Rights, these objects were to a large extent effected. In the meantime original work of a high order was being produced both in England and America by such writers as Bradley, Stout, Bertrand, Russell, Baldwin, Urban, Montague, and others, and a new interest in foreign works, German, French and Italian, which had either become classical or were attracting public attention, had developed. The scope of the library thus became extended into something more international, and it is entering on the fifth decade of its existence in the hope that it may contribute to that mutual understanding between countries which is so pressing a need of the present time. The need which Professor Muir had stressed is no less pressing today. And few will deny that philosophy has much to do with enabling us to meet it, although no one, least of all Muirhead himself, would regard that as the sole, or even the main, object of philosophy. As Professor Muirhead continues to lend the distinction of his name to the library of philosophy it seemed not inappropriate to allow him to recall us to these aims in his own words. The emphasis on the history of thought also seemed to me very timely, and the number of important works promised for the library in the very near future augur well for the continued fulfillment, in this and other ways, of the expectations of the original editor. H. D. Lewis. Preface. This book has grown out of an attempt to harmonize two different tendencies, one in psychology, the other in physics, with both of which I find myself in sympathy, although at first sight they might seem inconsistent. On the one hand, many psychologists, especially those of the behaviorist school tend to adopt what is essentially a materialistic position, as a matter of method if not of metaphysics. They make psychology increasingly dependent on physiology and external 
observation, and tend to think of matter as something much more solid and indubitable than mind. Meanwhile the physicists, especially Einstein, and other exponents of the theory of relativity, have been making matter less and less material. Their world consists of events from which matter is derived by a logical construction. Whoever reads, for example, Professor Eddington's Space, Time and Gravitation, Cambridge, University Press, 1920, will see that an old-fashioned materialism can receive no support from modern physics. I think that what has permanent value in the outlook of the behaviorists is the feeling that physics is the most fundamental science at present in existence. But this position cannot be called materialistic, if, as seems to be the case, physics does not assume the existence of matter. The view that seems to me to reconcile the materialistic tendency of psychology with the anti-materialistic tendency of physics is the view of William James and the American New Realists, according to which the stuff of the world is neither mental nor material, but a neutral stuff out of which both are constructed. I have endeavored in this work to develop this view in some detail as regards the phenomena with which psychology is concerned. My thanks are due to Professor John B. Watson and to D.R. T. P. Nunn for reading my MSS at an early stage and helping me with many valuable suggestions, also to Mr. A. Wolgamuth for much very useful information. As regards important literature, I have also to acknowledge the help of the editor of this library of philosophy, Professor Muirhead, for several suggestions by which I have profited. The work has been given in the form of lectures both in London and Peking, and one lecture, that on desire, has been published in the Athenaeum. There are a few allusions to China in this book, all of which were written before I had been in China, and are not intended to be taken by. The reader is geographically accurate. I have used China merely as a synonym for a distant country when I wanted illustrations of unfamiliar things. Peking, January 1921. Contents. I. Recent Criticisms of Consciousness. 2. Instinct and Habit. 3. Desire and Feeling. I. V. Influence of Past History on Present Occurrences. In Living Organisms. V. Psychological and Physical Causal Laws. V. Introspection. 7. The Definition of Perception. 8. Sensations and Images. X. Memory. X. Words and Meaning. 11. General Ideas and Thought. 12. Belief. 13. Truth and Falsehood. 14. Emotions and Will. 15. Characteristics of Mental Phenomena. The Analysis of Mind. Lecture I. Recent Criticisms of Consciousness. There are certain occurrences which we are in the habit of calling mental. Among these we may take as typical believing and desiring. The exact definition of the word mental will, I hope, emerges. The lectures proceed, for the present, I shall mean by it whatever. Occurrences would commonly be called mental. I wish in these lectures to analyze as fully as I can what it is that really takes place when we, e.g. believe or desire. In this first lecture I shall be concerned to refute a theory which is widely held, and which I formerly held myself, the theory that the essence of everything mental is a certain quite peculiar something called consciousness, conceived either as a relation to objects, or as a 
Pervading quality of psychical phenomena. The reasons which I shall give against this theory will be mainly derived from previous authors. There are two sorts of reasons, which will divide my lecture into two parts. One, direct reasons, derived from analysis and its difficulties. Two, indirect reasons, derived from observation of animals, comparative psychology, and of the insane and hysterical psychoanalysis. Few things are more firmly established in popular philosophy than the distinction between mind and matter. Those who are not professional metaphysicians are willing to confess that they do not know what mind actually is, or how matter is constituted, but they remain convinced that there is an impassable gulf between the two, and that both belong to what actually exists in the world. Philosophers, on the other hand, have maintained often that matter is a mere fiction imagined by mind, and sometimes that mind is a mere property of a certain kind of matter. Those who maintain that mind is the reality and matter an evil dream are called idealists, a word which has a different meaning in philosophy from that which it bears in ordinary life. Those who argue that matter is the reality and mind a mere property of protoplasm are called materialists. They have been rare among philosophers, but common at certain periods among men of science. Idealists, materialists, and Ordinary mortals have been in agreement on one point, that they knew sufficiently what they meant by the words, mind, and matter, to be able to conduct their debate intelligently. Yet it was just in this point, as to which they were at one, that they seemed to me to have been all alike. In error, the stuff of which the world of our experience is composed is, in my Belief, neither mind nor matter, but something more primitive than either. Both mind and matter seem to be composite, and the stuff of which they are compounded lies in a sense between the two, in a sense. Above them both, like a common ancestor. As regards matter, I have set forth my reasons for this view on former occasions, asterisk and I shall not now repeat them. But the question of mind is more difficult, and it is this question that I propose to discuss in these lectures. A great deal of what I shall have to say is not original, indeed, much recent work, in various fields, has tended to show the necessity of such theories as those which I shall be advocating. Accordingly, in this first lecture, I shall try to give a brief description of the systems of ideas within which our investigation is to be carried on. Asterisk, our knowledge of the external world, Allen and Onwen. Chapters 3 and IV. Also, Mysticism and Logic, Essays 7 and 8. If there is one thing that may be said, in the popular estimation, too. Characterize mind, that one thing is, consciousness. We say that we are, conscious, of what we see and hear, of what we remember, and of our own, thoughts and feelings. Most of us believe that tables and chairs are, not conscious. We think that when we sit in a chair, we are aware, of sitting in it, but it is not aware of being sat in. It cannot for. A moment be doubted that we are right in believing that there is some difference between us and the chair in this respect, so much may be taken as fact, and as a datum for our inquiry. But as soon as we try to say what exactly the difference is, we become involved in perplexities. Is consciousness ultimate and simple, something to be merely accepted? and contemplated? Or is it something complex, perhaps consisting in our 
way of behaving in the presence of objects, or, alternatively, in the existence in us of things called ideas, having a certain relation to objects, though different from them, and only symbolically representative of them. Such questions are not easy to answer, but until they are answered we cannot profess to know what we mean by saying that we are possessed of consciousness. Before considering modern theories, let us look first at consciousness. From the standpoint of conventional psychology, since this embodies views which naturally occur when we begin to reflect upon the subject. For this purpose, let us as a preliminary consider different ways of being conscious. First, there is the way of perception. We perceive tables and chairs, horses and dogs, our friends, traffic passing in the street in short. Anything which we recognize through the senses. I leave on one side for the present the question whether pure sensation is to be regarded as a form of consciousness, what I am speaking of now is perception, where, according to conventional psychology, we go beyond the sensation to the thing which it represents. When you hear a donkey bray, you not only hear a noise, but realize that it comes from a donkey. When you see a table, you not only see a colored surface, but realize that it is hard. The addition of these elements that go beyond crude sensation is said to constitute perception. We shall have more to say about this at a later stage. For the moment, I am merely concerned to note that perception of objects is one of the most obvious examples of what is called consciousness. We are conscious of anything that we perceive. We may take next the way of memory. If I set to work to recall what I did this morning, that is a form of consciousness different from perception, since it is concerned with the past. There are various Problems as to how we can be conscious now of what no longer exists. These will be dealt with incidentally when we come to the analysis of memory. From memory it is an easy step to what are called ideas, not in the platonic sense, but in that of Locke, Berkeley and Hume, in which they are opposed to impressions. You may be conscious of a friend either. By seeing him or by thinking of him, and by thought, you can be conscious of objects which cannot be seen, such as the human race or physiology. Thought, in the narrower sense, is that form of consciousness which consists in ideas as opposed to impressions or mere memories. We may end our preliminary catalogue with belief, by which I mean that way of being conscious which may be either true or false. We say that a man is conscious of looking a fool, by which we mean that he believes. He looks a fool, and is not mistaken in this belief. This is a different form of consciousness from any of the earlier ones. It is the form which gives knowledge, in the strict sense, and also error. It is, at least, apparently, more complex than our previous forms of consciousness. Though we shall find that they are not so separable from it as they might appear to be. Besides ways of being conscious there are other things that would ordinarily be called mental, such as desire and pleasure and pain. These raise problems of their own, which we shall reach in Lecture 3. But the hardest problems are those that arise concerning ways of being conscious. These ways, taken together, are called the cognitive elements in mind, and it is these that will occupy us most during the following lectures. There is one element which seems obviously in common among the different ways of being conscious, and that is, that they are all directed to objects. 
We are conscious of something. The consciousness, it seems, is one thing, and that of which we are conscious is another thing. Unless we are to acquiesce in the view that we can never be conscious of anything outside our own minds, we must say that the object of consciousness need not be mental, though the consciousness must be. I am speaking within the circle of conventional doctrines, not expressing my own beliefs. This direction towards an object is commonly regarded as typical of every form of cognition, and sometimes of mental life. Altogether, we may distinguish two different tendencies in traditional psychology. There are those who take mental phenomena naively, just as they would physical phenomena. This school of psychologists tends not to emphasize the object. On the other hand, there are those whose primary Interest is in the apparent fact that we have knowledge, that there is a world surrounding us of which we are aware. These men are interested in the mind because of its relation to the world, because knowledge, if it is a fact, is a very mysterious one. Their interest in psychology is naturally centered in the relation of consciousness to its object, a uh, problem which, properly, belongs rather to theory of knowledge. We may take as one of the best and most typical representatives of this school. The Austrian psychologist Brentano, whose psychology from the empirical standpoint, asterisk, though published in 1874, is still influential and was the starting point of a great deal of interesting work. He says, p. 115. Asterisk, Psychology vom Empirischen Standpunkt, Volume I, 1874. The second volume was never published. Every psychical phenomenon is characterized by what the scholastics have the Middle Ages called the intentional, also the mental, an existence of an object, and what we, although with not quite unambiguous expressions, would call relation to a content, direction towards an object, which is not here to be understood as a reality, or imminent objectivity. Each contains something in itself as an object, though not each in the same way. In presentation something is presented, in judgment something is acknowledged or rejected, in love something is loved, in hatred hated, in desire desired, and so on. This intentional inexistence is exclusively peculiar to psychical phenomena. No physical phenomenon shows anything similar. And so we can define psychical phenomena by saying that they are phenomena which intentionally contain an object in themselves. The view here expressed, that relation to an object is an ultimate, irreducible characteristic of mental phenomena, is one which I shall be concerned to combat. Like Brentano, I am interested in psychology, not so much for its own sake, as for the light that it may throw on the problem of knowledge. Until very lately I believed, as he did, that mental phenomena have essential reference to objects, except, possibly in the case of pleasure and pain. Now I no longer believe this, even in the case of knowledge. I shall try to make my reasons for this rejection. Clear as we proceed, it must be evident at first glance that the analysis of knowledge is rendered more difficult by the rejection, but the apparent simplicity of Brentano's view of knowledge will be found, if I am not mistaken, incapable of maintaining itself either against an analytic scrutiny or against a host of facts in psychoanalysis and animal psychology. I do not wish to minimize the problems. I will 
merely observe, in mitigation of our prospective labors, the thinking. However it is to be analyzed, is in itself a delightful occupation. And that there is no enemy to thinking so deadly as a false simplicity. Traveling, whether in the mental or the physical world, is a joy, and it is good to know that, in the mental world at least, there are vast countries still very imperfectly explored. The view expressed by Brentano has been held very generally, and developed by many writers. Among these we may take as an example his Austrian successor Maynong. Asterisk according to him there are three elements involved in the thought of an object. These three he calls the act, the content and the object. The act is the same in any two cases of the same kind of consciousness, for instance, if I think of Smith or think of Brown, the act of thinking, in itself, is exactly similar on both occasions. But the content of my thought, the particular event that is happening in my mind, is different when I think of Smith and when I think of Brown. The content, Maynong argues, must not be confounded with the object, since the content must exist in my mind at the moment when I have the thought, whereas the object need not do so. The object may be something past or future, it may be physical, not mental, it may be something abstract, like equality for example, it may be something imaginary, like a golden mountain, or it may even be something self-contradictory, like a round square. But in all these cases, so. He contends, the content exists when the thought exists, and is what distinguishes it, as an occurrence, from other thoughts. Asterisk C, e.g. his article, Uber Gegenstand Horror Orning. Und deren Verhaltenis zur inneren Warnemung, Zeitschrift. Für Psychologie und Physiologie der Sinnesorgen, Volume XXI. PP 182 to 272 1899 especially PP 185 to 8 To make this theory concrete let us suppose that you are thinking of ST Halls then according to Maynong we have to distinguish three Elements which are necessarily combined in constituting the one thought. First, there is the act of thinking, which would be just the same. Whatever you were thinking about. Then there is what makes the character. Of the thought is contrasted with other thoughts, this is the content. And finally there is St. Paul's, which is the object of your thought. There must be a difference between the content of a thought and what it is about, since the thought is here and now, whereas what it is about may not be, hence it is clear that the thought is not identical with St. Paul's. This seems to show that we must distinguish between content and object. But if Maynong is right, there can be no thought without an object. The connection of the two is essential. The object might exist without the thought, but not the thought without the object. The three elements of act, content, and object are all required to constitute the one single occurrence called thinking of St. Paul's. The above analysis of a thought, though I believe it to be mistaken, is very useful is affording a schema in terms of which other theories can be stated. In the remainder of the present lecture I shall state in outline the view which I advocate, and show how various other views out of which mine has grown result from modifications of the threefold analysis into act, content and object. The first criticism I have to make is that the ACT seems unnecessary and fictitious. The occurrence of the content of a thought constitutes 
the occurrence of the thought. Empirically, I cannot discover anything corresponding to the supposed act, and theoretically I cannot see that. It is indispensable. We say, underscore I underscore think so and so, and this word, I, suggests that thinking is the act of a person. Meinong's act, is the ghost of the subject, or what once was the full-blooded soul. It is supposed that thoughts cannot just come and go, but need a person to think them. Now, of course it is true that thoughts can be collected into bundles, so that one bundle is my thoughts, another is your thoughts, and a third is the thoughts of Mr. Jones. But I think the person is not an ingredient in the single thought, he is rather constituted by relations of the thoughts to each other and to the body. This is a large question, which need not, in its entirety, concern us. At present, all that I am concerned with for the moment is that the grammatical forms, I think, you think, and Mr. Jones thinks, are misleading if regarded as indicating an analysis of a single thought. It would be better to say, it thinks in me, like, it rains here, or Better still, there is a thought in me. This is simply on the ground that what Mainong calls the act in thinking is not empirically discoverable, or logically deducible from what we can observe. The next point of criticism concerns the relation of content and object. The reference of thoughts to objects is not, I believe, the simple direct essential thing that Brentano and Mainong represent it as being. It seems to me to be derivative, and to consist largely in beliefs. Beliefs that what constitutes the thought is connected with various other elements which together make up the object. You have, say, an image of St. Paul's, or merely the word St. Paul's, in your head. You Believe, however vaguely and dimly, that this is connected with what you would see if you went to St. Paul's, or what you would feel if you touched its walls, it is further connected with what other people see and feel, with services and the Dean and Chapter and Sir Christopher Wren. These things are not mere thoughts of yours, but your thought stands in a relation to them of which you are more or less aware. The awareness of this relation is a further thought, and constitutes your feeling that the original thought had an object. But in pure imagination you can get very similar thoughts without these accompanying beliefs, and in this case your thoughts do not have objects or seem to have them. Thus in such instances you have content without object. On the other hand, in seeing or hearing it would be less misleading to say that you have object without content, since what you see or hear is actually part of the physical world, though not matter in the sense of physics. Thus the whole question of the relation of mental occurrences to objects grows very complicated, and cannot be settled by regarding reference to objects as of the essence of thoughts. All the above remarks are merely preliminary, and will be expanded later. Speaking in popular and unphilosophical terms, we may say that the content of a thought is supposed to be something in your head when you Think the thought, while the object is usually something in the outer world. It is held that knowledge of the outer world is constituted by the relation to the object, while the fact that knowledge is different from what it knows is due to the fact that knowledge comes by way of contents. We can begin to state the difference between realism and Idealism in terms of this opposition of contents and objects. Speaking quite roughly and approximately, we may say that idealism tends to 
suppress the object, while realism tends to suppress the content. Idealism, accordingly, says that nothing can be known except thoughts. And all the reality that we know is mental, while realism maintains that. We know objects directly, in sensation certainly, and perhaps also in memory and thought. Idealism does not say that nothing can be known beyond the present thought, but it maintains that the context of vague belief, which we spoke of in connection with the thought of S.T. Hall's, only takes you to other thoughts, never to anything radically different from thoughts. The difficulty of this view is in regard to sensation, where it seems as if we came into direct contact with the outer world. But the Berkeleyan way of meeting this difficulty is so familiar that I need not enlarge upon it now. I shall return to it in a later lecture, and will only observe, for the present, that there seem to me no valid Grounds for regarding what we see and hear is not part of the physical world. Realists, on the other hand, as a rule, suppress the content, and maintain that a thought consists either of act and object alone, or of object alone. I have been in the past a realist, and I remain a realist. As regards sensation, but not as regards memory or thought. I will try to explain what seem to me to be the reasons for and against various kinds of realism. Modern idealism professes to be by no means confined to the present. Thought or the present thinker in regard to its knowledge, indeed, it contends that the world is so organic, so dovetailed, that from any one portion the whole can be inferred, as the complete skeleton of an extinct animal can be inferred from one bone. But the logic by which this supposed organic nature of the world is nominally demonstrated appears to realists, as it does to me, to be faulty. They argue that, if we cannot know the physical world directly, we cannot really know. Anything outside our own minds, the rest of the world may be merely our dream. This is a dreary view, and they therefore seek ways of escaping from it. Accordingly they maintain that in knowledge we are in direct contact with objects, which may be, and usually are, outside our own minds. No doubt they are prompted to this view, in the first place, by Bias, namely, by the desire to think that they can know of the existence of a world outside themselves. But we have to consider, not what led them to desire the view, but whether their arguments for it are valid. There are two different kinds of realism, according as we make a thought. Consist of act and object, or of object alone. Their difficulties are different, but neither seems tenable all through. Take, for the sake of definiteness, the remembering of a past event. The remembering occurs now, and is therefore necessarily not identical with the past event. So long as we retain the act, this need cause no difficulty. The act of remembering occurs now, and has on this view a certain essential relation to the past event which it remembers. There is no logical objection to this theory, but there is the objection, which we spoke of earlier, that the act seems mythical, and is not to be found by observation. If, on the other hand, we try to constitute memory without the act, we are driven to a content, since we must have something that happens now, as opposed to the event which happened in the past. Thus, when we reject the act, which I think we must, we are driven to a theory of memory which is more akin to idealism. These arguments, however, do not apply to sensation. It is especially sensation, I think, which is 
considered by those realists who retain only the object, asterisk their views, which are chiefly held in America, or in large measure derived from. William James, and before going further it will be well to consider the revolutionary doctrine which he advocated. I believe this doctrine contains important new truth, and what I shall have to say will be in a considerable measure inspired by it. Asterisk this is explicitly the case with Max, analysis of sensations, a book of fundamental importance in the present. Connection. Translation of 5th German edition, Open Court. Co. 1914. First German edition, 1886. William James's view was first set forth in an essay called Does Consciousness Exist? Asterisk in this essay he explains how what used to be the soul has gradually been refined down to the transcendental ego, which, he says, attenuates itself to a thoroughly ghostly condition, being only a name for the fact that the content of experience is known. It loses personal form and activity these passing over to the content and becomes a bare bewusstheit or bewusstsein überhaupt of which in its own right absolutely nothing can be said. I believe, he, continues, that consciousness, when once it has evaporated to this, the state of pure diaphanity, is on the point of disappearing altogether. It is the name of a non-entity, and has no right to a place among first principles. Those who still cling to it are clinging to a mere echo. The faint rumor left behind by the disappearing soul upon the air of philosophy p. 2. Asterisk, Journal of Philosophy, Psychology and Scientific Methods, Volume I, 1904. Reprinted in Essays in Radical Empiricism, Longmans, Green and Co. 1912 pp. 1 to 38 to which references in what follows refer he explains that this is no sudden change in his opinions for 20 years past he says i have mistrusted consciousness as an entity for seven or eight years past i have suggested its non-existence to my students and tried to give them its pragmatic equivalent in realities of experience. It seems to me that the hour is ripe for it to be openly and universally discarded. P. 3. His next concern is to explain away the air of paradox, for James was never willfully paradoxical. Undeniably, he says, thoughts do exist. I mean only to deny that the word stands for an entity, but to Insist most emphatically that it does stand for a function. There is, I, mean, no aboriginal stuff or quality of being, contrasted with that of, which material objects are made, out of which our thoughts of them are, made, but there is a function in experience which thoughts perform, and for the performance of which this quality of being is invoked. That. Function is knowing pp. 3 to 4. James's view is that the raw material out of which the world is built up is not of two sorts, one matter and the other mind, but that it is arranged in different patterns by its interrelations, and that some arrangements may be called mental, while others may be called physical. My thesis is, he says, that if we start with the supposition that there is only one primal stuff or material in the world, a stuff of which everything is composed, and if we call that stuff pure experience, then knowing can easily be explained as a particular sort of relation towards one another into which portions of pure experience may enter. 
The relation itself is a part of pure experience, one of its terms becomes the subject or bearer of the knowledge, the knower, the other becomes the object known, p. 4. After mentioning the duality of subject and object, which is supposed to constitute consciousness, he proceeds in italics, experience, I believe, has no such inner duplicity, and the separation of it into consciousness and content comes, not by way of subtraction, but by way of addition, p. 9. He illustrates his meaning by the analogy of paint as it appears in a paint shop and as it appears in a picture, in the one case it is just saleable matter, while in the other it performs a spiritual function. Just so, I maintain, he continues, does a given undivided portion of experience, taken in one context of associates, play the part of a knower, of a state of mind, of consciousness, while in a different context the same undivided bit of experience plays the part of a thing known, of an objective content. In a word, in one group it figures as a thought, in another group as a thing pp. 9 to 10. He does not believe in the supposed immediate certainty of thought. Let the case be what it may in others, he says, I am as confident as I am of anything that, in myself, the stream of thinking, which I recognize emphatically as a phenomenon, is only a careless name for what, when scrutinized, reveals itself to consist chiefly of the stream of my breathing. The, I think, which Kant said must be able to accompany all my objects, is the, I breathe, which actually does accompany them, pp. 36 to 37. The same view of consciousness is set forth in the succeeding essay. A world of pure experience, I.B. pp. 39 to 91. The use of the phrase, pure experience, in both essays points to a lingering influence of idealism. Experience, like consciousness, must be a product, not part of the primary stuff of the world. It must be possible, if James is right in his main contentions, that roughly the same stuff, differently arranged, would not give rise to anything that could be called experience. This word has been dropped by the American realists, among whom we may mention specially Professor R. B. Perry of Harvard and Mr. Edwin B. Holt. The interests of this school or in general philosophy and the philosophy of the sciences rather than in psychology, they have derived a strong impulsion from James, but have more interest than he had in logic and mathematics and the abstract part of philosophy. They speak of neutral entities as the stuff out of which both mind and matter are constructed. Thus Holt says, if the terms and propositions of logic must be substantialized, they are all strictly of one substance, for which perhaps the least dangerous name is neutral stuff. The relation of neutral stuff to matter and mind we shall have presently to consider at considerable length. Asterisk. Asterisk, the concept of consciousness geo. Allen and Co., 1914. P. 52. My own belief for which the reasons will appear in subsequent lectures is that James is right in rejecting consciousness as an entity, and that the American realists are partly right, though not wholly, in considering that both mind and matter are composed of a neutral stuff which, in isolation, is neither mental nor material. I should admit this view as regards sensations, what is heard or seen, belongs equally to psychology and to physics. 
But I should say that images belong only to the mental world, while those occurrences, if any, which do not form part of any experience belong only to the physical world. There are, it seems to me, prima facie different kinds of causal laws, one belonging to physics and the other to psychology. The law of gravitation, for example, is a physical law, while the law of association is a psychological law. Sensations are subject to both kinds of laws, and are therefore truly neutral in Holt's sense. But entities subject only to physical laws, or only to psychological laws, are not neutral, and may be called respectively purely material and purely mental. Even those, however, which are purely mental will not have that intrinsic reference to objects which Brentano assigns to them and which constitutes the essence of consciousness as ordinarily understood. But, it is now time to pass on to other modern tendencies, also hostile to consciousness. There is a psychological school called, behaviorists, of whom the protagonist is Professor John B. Watson, asterisk formerly of the Johns Hopkins University. To them also, on the whole, belongs Professor John Dewey who, with James and D.R. Schiller, was one of the three founders of pragmatism. The view of the behaviorists is that nothing can be known except by external observation. They deny altogether that there is a separate source of knowledge called introspection by which we can know things about ourselves which we could never observe in others. They do not by any means deny that all sorts of things may go on in our minds, they only say that such things, if they occur, are not susceptible of scientific observation, and do not therefore concern psychology as a science. Psychology as a science, they say, is only concerned with behavior, i.e. with what we do, this alone, they contend, can be accurately observed. Whether we think meanwhile, they tell us, cannot be known, in their observation of the behavior of human beings, they have not so far found any evidence of thought. True, we talk a great deal, and imagine that in so doing we are showing that we can think, but behaviorists say that the talk they have to listen to can be explained without supposing that people think. Where you might expect a chapter on thought processes, you come instead upon a chapter on the language habit. It is humiliating to find how terribly adequate this hypothesis turns out to be. Asterisk see especially his behavior, an introduction to Comparative Psychology, New York, 1914. Behaviorism has not, however, sprung from observing the folly of men. It is the wisdom of animals that has suggested the view. It has always been a common topic of popular discussion whether animals think on this topic people are prepared to take sides without having the vaguest idea what they mean by thinking. Those who desired to investigate such questions were led to observe the behavior of animals, in the hope that their behavior would throw some light on their mental faculties. At first sight, it might seem that this is so. People say that a dog knows its name because it comes when it is called, and that it remembers its master, because it looks sad in his absence, but wags its tail and barks when he returns. That the dog behaves in this way is matter of observation, but that it knows or remembers anything is an inference, and in fact a very doubtful one. The more such inferences are examined, the more precarious they are seen to be. Hence the study of 
Animal behavior has been gradually led to abandon all attempt at mental interpretation. And it can hardly be doubted that, in many cases of complicated behavior very well adapted to its ends, there can be no prevision of those ends. The first time a bird builds a nest, we can hardly suppose it knows that there will be eggs to be laid in it, or that it will sit on the eggs, or that they will hatch into young birds. It does what it does at each stage because instinct gives it an impulse to do just that, not because it foresees and desires the result of its actions. Asterisk. Asterisk an interesting discussion of the question whether instinctive actions, when first performed, involve any prevision, however vague, will be found in Lloyd Morgan's Instinct and Experience, Methuen, 1912, Chap. E. Careful observers of animals, being anxious to avoid precarious inferences, have gradually discovered more and more how to give an account of the actions of animals without assuming what we call consciousness. It has seemed to the behaviorists that similar methods can be applied to human behavior, without assuming anything not open to external observation. Let us give a crude illustration, too crude for the authors in question, but capable of affording a rough insight into their meaning. Suppose two children in a school, both of whom are asked, what is six times nine? One says 54, the other says 56. The one, we say, knows what 6 times 9 is, the other does not. But, all that we can observe is a certain language habit. The one child has acquired the habit of saying, 6 times 9 is 54, the other has not. There is no more need of thought in this than there is when. A horse turns into his accustomed stable, there are merely more numerous and complicated habits. There is obviously an observable fact called knowing such and such a thing, examinations or experiments for discovering such facts. But all that is observed or discovered is a certain set of habits in the use of words. The thoughts, if any, in the Mind of the examinee are of no interest to the examiner, nor has the examiner any reason to suppose even the most successful examinee capable of even the smallest amount of thought. Thus what is called knowing, in the sense in which we can ascertain what other people know, is a phenomenon exemplified in their physical behavior, including spoken and written words. There is no reason so. Watson argues to suppose that their knowledge is anything beyond the habits shown in this behavior, the inference that other people have something non-physical called mind or thought is therefore unwarranted. So far, there is nothing particularly repugnant to our prejudices in the conclusions of the behaviorists. We are all willing to admit that other people are thoughtless. But when it comes to ourselves, we feel convinced that we can actually perceive our own thinking. Cogito, ergo, some would be regarded by most people as having a true premis. This, however, the behaviorist denies. He maintains that our knowledge of ourselves is no different in kind from our knowledge of other people. We may see more, because our own body is easier to observe than that of other people, but we do not see anything radically unlike what we see of others. Introspection, as a separate source of knowledge, is entirely denied by psychologists of this school. I shall discuss this question at length in a later lecture, for the present I will only observe that. It is by no means simple, and that, though I believe the behaviorists 
somewhat overstate their case, yet there is an important element of truth in their contention, since the things which we can discover by introspection do not seem to differ in any very fundamental way from the things which we discover by external observation. So far, we have been principally concerned with knowing, but it might well be maintained that desiring is what is really most characteristic of mind. Human beings are constantly engaged in achieving some end. They feel pleasure in success and pain in failure. In a purely material world, it may be said, there would be no opposition of pleasant and unpleasant, good and bad, what is desired and what is feared. A man's acts are governed by purposes. He decides, let us suppose, to go to a certain place, whereupon he proceeds to the station, takes his ticket, and enters the train. If the usual route is blocked by an accident, he goes by some other route. All that he does is determined or so it seems by the end he has in view, by what lies in front of him, rather, than by what lies behind. With dead matter, this is not the case. A stone at the top of a hill may start rolling, but it shows no pertinacity in trying to get to the bottom. Any ledge or obstacle will stop it, and it will exhibit no signs of discontent if this happens. It is not attracted by the pleasantness of the valley, as a sheep or cow might be, but propelled by the steepness of the hill at the place where it is. In all this we have characteristic differences between the behavior of animals and the behavior of matter is studied by physics. Desire, like knowledge, is, of course, in one sense an observable phenomenon. An elephant will eat a bun, but not a mutton chop, a duck will go into the water, but a hen will not. But when we think of our own desires, most people believe that we can know them by an immediate self-knowledge which does not depend upon observation of our actions. Yet if this were the case, it would be odd that people are so often mistaken as to what they desire. It is matter of common observation that so and so does not know his own motives, or that A is envious of B and malicious about him, but quite unconscious of being so. Such people are called self-deceivers, and are supposed to have had to go through some more or less elaborate process of concealing from themselves what would otherwise have been obvious. I believe that this is an entire mistake. I believe that the discovery of our own motives can only be made by the same process by which we discover other people's, namely, the process of observing our actions and inferring the desire which could prompt them. A desire is conscious when we have told ourselves that we have it. A hungry man may say to himself, oh, I do want my lunch. Then his desire is conscious, but it only differs from an unconscious desire by the presence of appropriate words, which is by no means a fundamental difference. The belief that a motive is normally conscious makes it easier to be mistaken as to our own motives than as to other people's. When some desire that we should be ashamed of is attributed to us, we notice that we have never had it consciously, in the sense of saying to ourselves, I wish that would happen. We therefore look for some other interpretation of our actions, and regard our friends as very unjust. When they refuse to be convinced by our repudiation of what we hold to be a calumny, moral considerations greatly increase the difficulty of clear thinking in this matter. It is commonly argued that people are not to blame for unconscious motives, but only for conscious ones.
in order, therefore, to be wholly virtuous it is only necessary to repeat virtuous formulas. We say, I desire to be kind to my friends, honorable in business, philanthropic towards the poor, public spirited in politics. So long as we refuse to allow ourselves, even in the watches of the night, to avow any contrary desires, we may be bullies at home, shady in the city, skinflints in paying wages and profiteers in dealing with the public, yet, if only conscious motives are to count in moral valuation, we shall remain model characters. This is an agreeable doctrine, and it is not surprising that men are unwilling to abandon it. But moral considerations are the worst enemies of the scientific spirit and we must dismiss them from our minds if we wish to arrive at truth. I believe as I shall try to prove in a later lecture that desire like force in mechanics, is of the nature of a convenient fiction. For describing shortly certain laws of behavior, a hungry animal is restless until it finds food, then it becomes quiescent. The thing which will bring a restless condition to an end is said to be what is desired. But only experience can show what will have this sedative effect, and it is easy to make mistakes. We feel dissatisfaction, and think that such and such a thing would remove it, but in thinking this, we are theorizing, not observing a patent fact. Our theorizing is often mistaken, and when it is mistaken there is a difference between what we think we desire and what in fact will bring satisfaction. This is such a common phenomenon that any theory of desire which fails to account for. It must be wrong. What have been called unconscious desires have been brought very much to the fore in recent years by psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, as everyone knows, is primarily a method of understanding hysteria and certain forms of insanity asterisk, but it has been found that there is much in the lives of ordinary men and women which bears a humiliating resemblance to the delusions of the insane. The connection of dreams, irrational beliefs and foolish actions with unconscious wishes has been brought to light, though with some exaggeration, by Freud and Jung and their followers. As regards the nature of these unconscious wishes, it seems to me though as a layman I speak with diffidence that many psychoanalysts are unduly narrow, no doubt the wishes they emphasize exist, but others, e.g. for honor and power, are equally operative and equally liable to concealment. This, however, does not affect the value of their general theories from the point of view of theoretic psychology, and it is from this point of view that their results are important for the analysis of mind. Asterisk there is a wide field of unconscious phenomena which does not depend upon psychoanalytic theories. Such occurrences as automatic writing lead Dr. Morton Prince to Say, as I view this question of the subconscious, far too much weight is given to the point of awareness or not. Awareness of our conscious processes. As a matter of fact, we find entirely identical phenomena, that is, identical in every respect but one that of awareness in which sometimes we are aware of these conscious phenomena and sometimes not p. 87 of subconscious phenomena by various authors. Rebman. D.R. Morton Price conceives that there may be consciousness without awareness. But this is a difficult view, and one which makes some definition of consciousness imperative. For Nate Part, I cannot see how to separate consciousness from awareness.
What, I think, is clearly established, is that a man's actions and beliefs may be wholly dominated by a desire of which he is quite unconscious, and which he indignantly repudiates when it is suggested to him. Such a desire is generally, in morbid cases, of a sort which the patient would consider wicked, if he had to admit that he had the desire, he would loathe himself. Yet it is so strong that it must force an outlet for itself, hence it becomes necessary to entertain whole systems of false beliefs in order to hide the nature of what is desired. The resulting delusions in very many cases disappear if the hysteric or lunatic can be made to face the facts about himself. The consequence of this is that the treatment of many forms of insanity has grown more psychological and less physiological than it used to be. Instead of looking for a physical defect in the brain, those who treat delusions look for the repressed desire which has found this contorted mode of expression. For those who do not wish to plunge into the somewhat repulsive and often rather wild theories of psychoanalytic pioneers, it will be worthwhile to read a little book by D.R. Bernard Hart on the psychology of insanity. Asterisk on this question of the mental as opposed to the physiological study of the causes of insanity, D.R. Hart says. Asterisk Cambridge, 1912, second edition, 1914. The following references are to the second edition. The psychological conception of insanity is based on the view that mental processes can be directly studied without any reference to the accompanying changes which are presumed to take place in the brain, and that insanity may therefore be properly attacked from the standpoint of psychology. P. 9. This illustrates a point which I am anxious to make clear from the outset. Any attempt to classify modern views, such as I propose to advocate, from the old standpoint of materialism and idealism, is only misleading. In certain respects, the views which I shall be setting forth approximate to materialism, in certain others, they approximate to its opposite. On this question of the study of delusions, the practical effect of the modern theories, as D.R. Hart points out, is emancipation from the materialist method. On the other hand, as he also points out, pp. 38-9, imbecility and dementia still have to be considered. Physiologically, is caused by defects in the brain. There is no inconsistency in this if, as we maintain, mind and matter are neither of them the actual stuff of reality, but different convenient groupings of an underlying material, then, clearly, the question whether, in regard to a given phenomenon, we are to seek a physical or a mental cause, is merely one to be decided by trial. Metaphysicians have argued endlessly as to the interaction of mind and matter. The followers of Descartes held that mind and matter are so different as to make any action of the one on the other impossible. When I will to move my arm, they said, it is not my will that operates on my arm, but God, who, by his omnipotence, moves my arm whenever I want it moved. The modern doctrine of psychophysical parallelism is not appreciably different from this theory of the Cartesian school. Psychophysical parallelism is the theory that mental and physical events each have causes in their own sphere, but run on side by side owing to the fact that every state of the brain coexists with a definite state of the mind, and vice versa. 
This view of the reciprocal causal independence of mind and matter has no basis except in metaphysical theory. Asterisk for us, there is no necessity to make any such assumption, which is very difficult to harmonize with obvious facts. I receive a letter inviting me to dinner. The letter is a physical fact, but my apprehension of its meaning is mental. Here we have an effect of matter on mind. In consequence of my apprehension of the meaning of the letter, I go to the right place at the right time. Here we have an effect of mind on matter. I shall try to persuade you, in the course of these lectures, that matter is not so material in mind. Not so mental as is generally supposed. When we are speaking of matter, it will seem as if we were inclining to idealism, when we are speaking of mind, it will seem as if we were inclining to materialism. Neither is the truth. Our world is to be constructed out of what the American realists call neutral entities, which have neither the hardness and indestructibility of matter, nor the reference to objects which is supposed to characterize mind. Asterisk it would seem, however, that Dr. Hart accepts this theory as a methodological precept. See his contribution to subconscious phenomena quoted above, especially pp. 121-2. There is, it is true, one objection which might be felt, not indeed to the action of matter on mind, but to the action of mind on matter. The laws of physics, it may be urged, are apparently adequate to explain everything that happens to matter, even when it is matter in a man's brain. This, however, is only a hypothesis, not an established theory. There is no cogent empirical reason for supposing that the laws Determining the motions of living bodies are exactly the same as those that apply to dead matter. Sometimes, of course, they are clearly the same. When a man falls from a precipice or slips on a piece of orange peel, his body behaves as if it were devoid of life. These are the occasions that make Bergson laugh. But when a man's bodily movements are what we call voluntary, they are, at any rate prima facie, very different in their laws from the movements of what is devoid of life. I do not wish to say dogmatically that the difference is irreducible. I think it highly probable that it is not. I say only that the study of the behavior of living bodies, in the present state of our knowledge, is distinct from physics. The study of gases was originally quite distinct from that of rigid bodies, and would never have advanced to its present state if it had not been independently pursued. Nowadays both the gas and the rigid body are manufactured out of a more primitive and universal kind of matter. In like manner, as a question of methodology, the laws of living bodies are to be studied, in the first place, without any undue haste to subordinate them to the laws of physics. Boyle's law, and the rest had to be discovered before the kinetic theory of gases became possible. But in psychology we are hardly yet at the stage of Boyle's law. Meanwhile we need not be held up by the bogey of the universal rigid exactness of physics. This is, as yet, a mere hypothesis, to be tested empirically without any preconceptions. It may be true, or it may not. So far, that is all we can say. Returning from this digression to our main topic, namely, the criticism of consciousness, we observe that Freud and his followers, though they have demonstrated beyond dispute the immense importance of unconscious 
desires in determining our actions and beliefs, have not attempted the task of telling us what an unconscious desire actually is, and have thus invested their doctrine with an air of mystery and mythology which forms a large part of its popular attractiveness. They speak always as though it were more normal for a desire to be conscious, and as though a positive cause had to be assigned for its being unconscious. Thus, the unconscious becomes a sort of underground prisoner, living in a dungeon, breaking in at long intervals upon our daylight respectability, with dark groans and maledictions and strange atavistic lusts. The ordinary reader, almost inevitably, thinks of this underground person as another consciousness prevented by what Freud calls the censor from making his voice heard in company, except on rare and dreadful occasions. When he shouts so loud that everyone hears him and there is a scandal. Most of us like the idea that we could be desperately wicked if only we let ourselves go. For this reason, the Freudian unconscious has been a consolation to many quiet and well-behaved persons. I do not think the truth is quite so picturesque as this. I believe in unconscious desire is merely a causal law of our behavior, asterisk namely, that we remain restlessly active until a certain state of affairs is realized when we achieve temporary equilibrium if we know beforehand what this state of affairs is, our desire is conscious, if not unconscious. The unconscious desire is not something actually existing, but merely a tendency to a certain behavior, it has exactly the same status as a force in dynamics. The unconscious desire is in no way mysterious, it is the natural primitive form of desire, from which the other has developed through our habit of observing and theorizing, often wrongly. It is not necessary to suppose, as Freud seems to do, that every unconscious wish was once conscious, and was then, in his terminology, repressed, because we disapproved of it. On the contrary, we shall suppose that, although Freudian repression undoubtedly occurs, and is important, it is not the usual reason for unconsciousness of our wishes. The usual reason is merely that wishes are all, to begin with, unconscious, and only become known when they are actively noticed. Usually, from laziness people do not notice, but accept the theory of human nature which they find current, and attribute to themselves. Whatever wishes this theory would lead them to expect. We used to be full of virtuous wishes, but since Freud our wishes have become, in the words of the prophet Jeremiah, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Both these views, in most of those who have held them, are the product of theory rather than observation, for observation requires effort, whereas repeating phrases does not. Asterisk cf. Hart, The Psychology of Insanity, p. 19. The interpretation of unconscious wishes which I have been advocating has been set forth briefly by Professor John B. Watson in an article called The Psychology of Wish Fulfillment, which appeared in the Scientific Monthly, in November, 1916. Two quotations will serve to show his point of view. The Freudians, he says, have made more or less of a metaphysical entity out of the censor. They suppose that when wishes are repressed, they are repressed into the unconscious, and that this mysterious Sensor stands at the trapdoor lying between the conscious and the unconscious. 
Many of us do not believe in a world of the unconscious. A few of us even have grave doubts about the usefulness of the term. Consciousness, hence we try to explain censorship along ordinary biological lines. We believe that one group of habits can down another group of habits or instincts. In this case our ordinary system of habits those which we call expressive of our real selves inhibit or quench keep inactive or partially inactive those habits and instinctive tendencies which belong largely in the past p. 483. Again, after speaking of the frustration of some impulses which is involved in acquiring the habits of a civilized adult, he continues. It is among these frustrated impulses that I would find the biological basis of the unfulfilled wish. Such wishes need never have been conscious, and need never have been suppressed into Freud's realm of the unconscious. It may be inferred from this that there is no particular reason for applying the term wish to such tendencies p. 485. One of the merits of the general analysis of mind which we shall be concerned with in the following lectures is that it removes the atmosphere of mystery from the phenomena brought to light by the psychoanalysts. Mystery is delightful, but unscientific, since it depends upon ignorance. Man has developed out of the animals, and there is no serious gap between him and the amoeba. Something closely analogous to knowledge and desire, as regards its effects on behavior, exists among animals, even where what we call consciousness is hard. To believe in something equally analogous exists in ourselves in cases where no trace of consciousness can be found. It is therefore natural to suppose that whatever may be the correct definition of consciousness, consciousness is not the essence of life or mind. In the following lectures, accordingly, this term will disappear until we have dealt with words, when it will re-emerge is mainly a trivial and unimportant outcome of linguistic habits. Lecture 2. Instinct and Habit. In attempting to understand the elements out of which mental phenomena are compounded, it is of the greatest importance to remember that from the protozoa to man there is nowhere a very wide gap either in structure or in behavior. From this fact it is a highly probable inference that there is also nowhere a very wide mental gap. It is, of course, possible that there may be, at certain stages in evolution, elements which are entirely new from the standpoint of analysis, though in their nascent form they have little influence on behavior and no very marked correlatives in structure. But the hypothesis of continuity in mental development is clearly preferable if no psychological facts make it impossible. We shall find, if I am not mistaken, that there are no facts which refute the hypothesis of mental continuity, and that, on the other, and this hypothesis affords a useful test of suggested theories as to the nature of mind. The hypothesis of mental continuity throughout organic evolution may be used in two different ways. On the one hand, it may be held that we have more knowledge of our own minds than those of animals, and that we should use this knowledge to infer the existence of something similar to our own mental processes in animals and even in plants. On the other hand, it may be held that animals and plants present simpler phenomena, more easily analyzed than those of human minds, on this ground it may be urged that explanations which are adequate in the case of animals ought 
not to be lightly rejected in the case of man. The practical effects of these two views are diametrically opposite, the first leads us to level up animal intelligence with what we believe ourselves to know about our own intelligence, while the second leads us to attempt a leveling down of our own intelligence to something not too remote from what we can observe in animals. It is therefore important to consider the relative justification of the two ways of applying the principle of continuity. It is clear that the question turns upon another, namely, which can we know best, the psychology of animals or that of human beings. If we can know most about animals, we shall use this knowledge as a basis for inference about human beings. If we can know most about human beings, we shall adopt the opposite procedure. And the question whether we can know most about the psychology of human beings or about that of animals turns upon yet another, namely, is introspection or external observation. The surer method in psychology. This is a question which I propose to discuss at length in Lecture V. I shall therefore content myself now with a statement of the conclusions to be arrived at. We know a great many things concerning ourselves which we cannot know. Nearly so directly concerning animals or even other people. We know when. We have a toothache, what we are thinking of, what dreams we have when. We are asleep, and a host of other occurrences which we only know about. Others when they tell us of them, or otherwise make them inferable. By their behavior. Thus, so far as knowledge of detached facts is. Concerned, the advantage is on the side of self-knowledge is against. External observation. But when we come to the analysis and scientific understanding of the facts, the advantages on the side of self-knowledge become far less clear. We know, for example, that we have desires and beliefs, but we do not know what constitutes a desire or a belief. The phenomena are so familiar that it is difficult to realize how little we really know about them. We see in animals, and to a lesser extent in plants, behavior more or less similar to that which, in us, is prompted by desires and beliefs, and we find that, as we descend in the scale of evolution, behavior becomes simpler, more easily reducible to rule, more scientifically analyzable and predictable. And just because we are not Misled by familiarity we find it easier to be cautious in interpreting behavior when we are dealing with phenomena remote from those of our own minds. Moreover, introspection, as psychoanalysis has demonstrated, is extraordinarily fallible even in cases where we feel a high degree of certainty. The net result seems to be that, though self-knowledge has a definite and important contribution to make to psychology, it is exceedingly misleading unless it is constantly checked and controlled by the test of external observation and by the theories which such observation suggests when applied to animal behavior. On the whole, therefore, there is probably more to be learnt about human psychology from animals than about animal psychology from human beings, but this conclusion is one of degree, and must not be pressed beyond a point. It is only bodily phenomena that can be directly observed in animals, or even, strictly speaking, in other human beings. We can observe such things as their movements, their physiological processes, and the sounds. They emit such things as desires and beliefs, which seem obvious to introspection, are not visible directly to external observation.
Accordingly, if we begin our study of psychology by external observation, we must not begin by assuming such things as desires and beliefs, but only such things as external observation can reveal, which will be characteristics of the movements and physiological processes of animals. Some animals, for example, always run away from light and hide themselves in dark places. If you pick up a mossy stone which is lightly embedded in the earth, you will see a number of small animals scuttling away from the unwanted daylight and seeking again the darkness of which you have deprived them. Such animals are sensitive to light, in the sense that their movements are affected by it, but it would be rash to infer that they have sensations in any way analogous to our sensations. A sight. Such inferences, which go beyond the observable facts, are to be avoided with the utmost care. It is customary to divide human movements into three classes, voluntary, reflex and mechanical. We may illustrate the distinction by a quotation from William James, Psychology, I, 12. If I hear the conductor calling, all aboard, as I enter the depot, my heart first stops, then palpitates, and my legs respond to the air waves falling on my tympanum by quickening their movements. If I stumble as I run, the sensation of falling provokes a movement of the hands towards the direction of the fall, the effect of which is to shield the body from too sudden a shock. If a cinder enter my eye, its lids close. Forcibly in a copious flow of tears tends to wash it out. These three responses to a sensational stimulus differ, however, in many respects. The closure of the eye and the lacrimation are quite involuntary, and so is the disturbance of the heart. Such involuntary responses we know as reflex acts. The motion of the arms to break the Shock of falling may also be called reflex, since it occurs too quickly to be deliberately intended, whether it be instinctive or whether it result from the pedestrian education of childhood may be doubtful, it is, at any rate, less automatic than the previous acts, for a man might, by conscious effort learn to perform it more skillfully, or even to suppress it altogether. Actions of this kind, with which instinct and volition enter upon equal terms, have been called semi-reflex. The act of running towards the train, on the other hand, has no instinctive element about it. It is purely the result of education, and is preceded by a consciousness of the purpose to be attained and a distinct mandate of the will. It is a voluntary act. Thus the animal's reflex and voluntary performances shade into each other gradually, being connected by acts which may often occur automatically, but may also be modified by conscious intelligence. An outside observer, unable to perceive the accompanying consciousness might be wholly at a loss to discriminate between the automatic acts and those which volition escorted. But if the criterion of mind's existence be the choice of the proper means for the attainment of a supposed end, all the acts alike seem to be inspired by intelligence, for appropriateness characterizes them all alike. There is one movement, among those that James mentions at first, which is not subsequently classified, namely, the stumbling. This is the kind of movement which may be called mechanical, it is evidently of a different kind from either reflex or voluntary movements, and more akin to the movements of dead matter. We may define a movement of an animal's 
body is mechanical when it proceeds as if only dead matter were involved. For example, if you fall over a cliff, you move under the influence of gravitation, and your center of gravity describes just as correct a parabola as if you were already dead. Mechanical movements have not the characteristic of appropriateness, unless by accident, as when a drunken man falls into a water butt and is sobered. But reflex. Involuntary movements are not always appropriate, unless in some very recondite sense. A moth flying into a lamp is not acting sensibly, no. More is a man who is in such a hurry to get his ticket that he cannot remember the name of his destination. Appropriateness is a complicated and merely approximate idea, and for the present we shall do well to dismiss it from our thoughts. As James states, there is no difference, from the point of view of the outside observer, between voluntary and reflex movements. The physiologist can discover that both depend upon the nervous system. And he may find that the movements which we call voluntary depend upon higher centers in the brain than those that are reflex. But he cannot discover anything as to the presence or absence of will or consciousness, for these things can only be seen from within, if at all. For the present, we wish to place ourselves resolutely in the position of outside observers, we will therefore ignore the distinction between voluntary and reflex movements. We will call the two together vital movements. We may then distinguish vital from mechanical movements by the fact that vital movements depend for their causation upon the special properties of the nervous system, while mechanical movements depend only upon the properties which animal bodies share with matter in general. There is need for some care if the distinction between mechanical and vital movements is to be made precise. It is quite likely that, if we knew more about animal bodies, we could deduce all their movements from the laws of chemistry and physics. It is already fairly easy to see how chemistry reduces to physics, i.e. how the differences between different chemical elements can be accounted for by differences of physical structure, the constituents of the structure being electrons which are exactly alike in all kinds of matter. We only know in part how to reduce physiology to chemistry, but we know enough to make it likely that the reduction is possible. If we suppose it effected, what would become of the difference between vital and mechanical movements? Some analogies will make the difference clear. A shock to a mass of dynamite produces quite different effects from an equal shock to a mass. Of steel, in the one case there is a vast explosion, while in the other case there is hardly any noticeable disturbance. Similarly, you may sometimes find on a mountainside a large rock poised so delicately that a touch will set it crashing down into the valley, while the rocks all round are so firm that only a considerable force can dislodge them what is analogous in these two cases is the existence of a great store of energy in unstable equilibrium ready to burst into violent motion by the addition of a very slight disturbance. Similarly, it requires only a very slight expenditure of energy to send a postcard with the words all is discovered, fly. But the effect in generating kinetic energy is said to be amazing. A human body, like a mass of dynamite, contains a store of energy in unstable equilibrium, ready to be directed in this direction or that by a disturbance which is physically very small. 
such as a spoken word. In all such cases the reduction of behavior to physical laws can only be effected by entering into great minuteness, so long as we confine ourselves to the observation of comparatively large masses, the way in which the equilibrium will be upset cannot be determined. Physicists distinguish between macroscopic and microscopic equations, the former determine the visible movements of bodies of ordinary size, the latter the minute occurrences in the smallest parts. It is only the microscopic equations that are supposed to be the same for all sorts of matter. The macroscopic equations result from a process of averaging out, and may be different in different cases. So, in our instance, the laws of macroscopic phenomena are different from mechanical and vital movements, though the laws of microscopic phenomena may be the same. We may say, speaking somewhat roughly, that a stimulus applied to the nervous system, like a spark to dynamite, is able to take advantage of the stored energy in unstable equilibrium, and thus to produce movements out of proportion to the proximate cause. Movements produced in this way are vital movements, while mechanical movements are those in which the stored energy of a living body is not involved. Similarly dynamite may be exploded, thereby displaying its characteristic properties, or may with due precautions, be carted about like any other mineral. The explosion is analogous to vital movements, the carting about to mechanical movements. Mechanical movements are of no interest to the psychologist, and it has only been necessary to define them in order to be able to exclude them. When a psychologist studies behavior, it is only vital movements that concern him. We shall, therefore, proceed to ignore mechanical movements, and study only the properties of the remainder. The next point is to distinguish between movements that are instinctive, and movements that are acquired by experience. This distinction also is, to some extent, one of degree. Professor Lloyd Morgan gives the following definition of instinctive behavior that which is, on its first occurrence, independent of prior experience, which tends to the well-being of the individual and the preservation of the race, which is similarly performed by all members of the same more or less restricted group of animals, and which may be subject to subsequent modification under the guidance of experience. Asterisk. Asterisk, instinct and experience, Methuen, 1912 p. 5. This definition is framed for the purposes of biology, and is in some respects unsuited to the needs of psychology. Though perhaps unavoidable, allusion to the same more or less restricted group of animals makes it impossible to judge what is instinctive in the behavior of an isolated individual. Moreover, the well-being of the individual and the preservation of the race is only a usual characteristic, not a universal one, of the sort of movements that, from our point of view, are to be called instinctive instances of harmful Instincts will be given shortly. The essential point of the definition, from our point of view, is that an instinctive movement is independent of prior experience. We may say that an instinctive movement is a vital movement performed by an animal the first time that it finds itself in a novel situation or, more correctly, one which it would perform if the situation were novel. Asterisk the instincts of an animal are different at different periods of its growth, and this fact may cause changes of behavior which are not due to learning. 
the maturing and seasonal fluctuation of the sex instinct affords a good illustration. When the sex instinct first matures, the behavior of an animal in the presence of a mate is different from its previous behavior in similar circumstances, but is not learnt, since it is just the same if the animal has never previously been in the presence of a mate. Asterisk, though this can only be decided by comparison with other members of the species, and thus exposes us to the need of comparison which we thought an objection to Professor Lloyd Morgan's definition. On the other hand, a movement is learnt, or embodies a habit, if it is due to previous experience of similar situations, and is not what it would be if the animal had had no such experience. There are various complications which blur the sharpness of this distinction in practice. To begin with, many instincts mature gradually. And while they are immature an animal may act in a fumbling manner which is very difficult to distinguish from learning. James, Psychology, E. 407, maintains that children walk by instinct, and that the awkwardness of their first attempts is only due to the fact that the instinct has not yet ripened. He hopes that some scientific widower, left alone with his offspring at the critical moment, may ere long test this suggestion on the living subject. However this may be, he quotes evidence to show that birds do not learn to fly, but fly by instinct when they reach the appropriate age IVP 406. In the second place, instinct often gives only a rough outline of the sort of thing to do, in which case learning is necessary in order to acquire certainty and precision in action. In the third place, even in the clearest cases of acquired habit, such as speaking, some instinct is required to set in motion the process of learning. In the case of speaking, the chief instinct involved is commonly supposed to be that of imitation, but this may be questioned. See Thorndike's Animal Intelligence, p. 253 ff. In spite of these qualifications, the broad distinction between instinct and habit is undeniable. To take extreme cases, every animal at birth can take food by instinct before it has had opportunity to learn on. The other hand, no one can ride a bicycle by instinct, though, after learning, the necessary movements become just as automatic as if they were instinctive. The process of learning, which consists in the acquisition of habits, has been much studied in various animals. Asterisk, for example, you put a hungry animal, say a cat, in a cage which has a door that can be opened by lifting a latch outside the cage you put food. The cat at first dashes all round the cage, making frantic efforts to force a way out. At last, by accident, the latch is lifted and the cat pounces on the food. Next. Day you repeat the experiment, and you find that the cat gets out much more quickly than the first time, although it still makes some random movements. The third day it gets out still more quickly, and before long, it goes straight to the latch and lifts it at once. Or you make a model of the Hampton Court maze, and put a rat in the middle, assaulted by the smell of food on the outside. The rat starts running down the passages, and is constantly stopped by blind alleys, but at last, by persistent attempts, it gets out. You repeat this experiment day after day, you measure the time taken by the rat in reaching the food, you find that the time rapidly diminishes, and that after a while the rat ceases to 
make any wrong turnings. It is by essentially similar processes that we learn speaking, writing, mathematics, or the government of an empire. Asterisk the scientific study of this subject may almost be said to begin with Thorndike's Animal Intelligence, Macmillan, 1911. Professor Watson, Behavior, pp. 262-3, has an ingenious theory as to the way in which habit arises out of random movements. I think there is a reason why his theory cannot be regarded as alone sufficient, but it seems not unlikely that it is partly correct. Suppose, for the sake of simplicity, that there are just ten random movements which may be made by the animal say, ten paths down which it may go and that only one of these leads to food, or whatever else represents success in the case in question. Then the successful movement always occurs during the animal's attempts, whereas each of the others, on the average, occurs in only half the attempts. Thus the tendency to repeat a previous performance, which is easily explicable without the intervention of consciousness, leads to a greater emphasis on the successful movement than on any other, and in time causes it alone to be performed. The objection to this view, if taken as the sole explanation, is that on improvement ought to set in till after the second trial, whereas experiment shows that already at the second attempt the animal does better than the first time. Something further is, therefore, required to account for the genesis of habit from random movements, but I see no reason to suppose that what is further required involves consciousness. Mr. Thorndike, op. sit p. 244, formulates two provisional laws of acquired behavior or learning, as follows. The law of effect is that, of several responses made to the same situation, those which are accompanied are closely followed by satisfaction to the animal will, other things being equal, be more firmly connected with the situation, so that, when it recurs, they will be more likely to recur, those which are accompanied are closely followed. By discomfort to the animal will, other things being equal, have their connections with that situation weakened, so that, when it recurs, they will be less likely to occur. The greater the satisfaction or discomfort, the greater the strengthening or weakening of the bond. The law of exercise is that, any response to a situation will, other things being equal, be more strongly connected with the situation. In proportion to the number of times it has been connected with that situation and to the average vigor and duration of the connections, with the explanation to be presently given of the meaning of satisfaction and discomfort, there seems every reason to accept these two laws. What is true of animals, as regards instinct and habit, is equally true of men. But the higher we rise in the evolutionary scale, broadly speaking, the greater becomes the power of learning, and the fewer are the occasions when pure instinct is exhibited unmodified in adult life. This applies with great force to man, so much so that some have thought. Instinct less important in the life of man than in that of animals. This, however, would be a mistake. Learning is only possible when instinct supplies the driving force. The animals in cages, which gradually learn to get out, perform random movements at first, which are purely instinctive. But for these random movements, they would never acquire the experience which afterwards enables them to produce the right movement. This is partly questioned by Hobhouse asterisk wrongly, I think.
Similarly, children learning to talk make all sorts of sounds. Until one day the right sound comes by accident. It is clear that the original making of random sounds, without which speech would never be learnt, is instinctive. I think we may say the same of all the habits and aptitudes that we acquire in all of them there has been present. Throughout some instinctive activity, prompting at first rather inefficient movements, but supplying the driving force while more and more effective methods are being acquired. A cat which is hungry smells fish and goes to the larder. This is a thoroughly efficient method when there is fish in the larder, and it is often successfully practiced by children. But in later life it is found that merely going to the larder does not cause fish to be there. After a series of random movements it is found that this result is to be caused by going to the city in the morning and coming back in the evening. No one would have guessed a priori that this movement of a middle-aged man's body would cause fish to come out of the sea into his larder, but experience shows that it does, and the middle-aged man therefore continues to go to the city. Just as the cat in the cage continues to lift the latch when it has once found it. Of course, in actual fact, human learning is rendered easier. Though psychologically more complex, through language, but at bottom. Language does not alter the essential character of learning, or of the part played by instinct in promoting learning. Language, however, is a subject upon which I do not wish to speak until a later lecture. Asterisk, Mind in Evolution, Macmillan, 1915 pp. 236-237. The popular conception of instinct errs by imagining it to be infallible and preternaturally wise, as well as incapable of modification. This is a complete delusion. Instinct, as a rule, is very rough and ready, able to achieve its result under ordinary circumstances, but easily misled by anything unusual. Chicks follow their mother by instinct, but when they are quite young they will follow with equal readiness any moving object remotely resembling their mother, or even a human being, James. Psychology, E. 396. Bergson, quoting Fabre, has made play with the supposed extraordinary accuracy of the solitary wasp Amophila, which lays its eggs in a caterpillar. On this subject I will quote from Drever's Instinct in Man, p. 92. According to Faber's observations, which Bergson accepts, the Amophila stings its prey exactly and unerringly in each of the nervous centers. The result is that the caterpillar is paralyzed, but not immediately. Killed, the advantage of this being that the larva cannot be injured by any movement of the caterpillar, upon which the egg is deposited, and is provided with fresh meat when the time comes. Now Dr. and Mrs. Peckham have shown that the sting of the wasp is not unerring, as Fabre alleges, that the number of stings is not constant. That sometimes the caterpillar is not paralyzed, and sometimes it is killed outright, and that the different circumstances do not apparently make any difference to the larva, which is not injured by slight movements of the caterpillar, nor by consuming food decomposed rather than fresh caterpillar. This illustrates how love of the marvelous may mislead even so careful. An observer is Fabre and so eminent a philosopher is Bergson. In the same chapter of D.R. Drever's book there are some interesting examples of the mistakes made by instinct. I will quote one as a sample. 
The larva of the lomchusa beetle eats the young of the ants, in whose nest it is reared. Nevertheless, the ants tend the lomchusa larva. With the same care they bestow on their own young. Not only so, but they apparently discover that the methods of feeding, which suit their own larva, would prove fatal to the guests, and accordingly they change their whole system of nursing. Lock, sit p. 106. Semen, dimeem, pp. 207-9, gives a good illustration of an instinct. Growing wiser through experience. He relates how hunters attract stags. By imitating the sounds of other members of their species, male or female, but find that the older a stag becomes the more difficult it is to deceive him, and the more accurate the imitation has to be. The literature of instinct is vast, and illustrations might be multiplied indefinitely. The main points as regards instinct, which need to be emphasized as against the popular conceptions of it, are 1. That instinct requires no prevision of the biological end which it serves. 2. That instinct is only adapted to achieve this end in the usual circumstances of the animal in question, and has no more precision than is necessary for success as a rule. 3. That processes initiated by instinct often come to be performed better after experience. 4. That instinct supplies the impulses to experimental movements which are required for the process of learning. 5. That instincts in their nascent stages are easily modifiable, and capable of being attached to various sorts of objects. All the above characteristics of instinct can be established by purely external observation, except the fact that instinct does not require prevision. This, though not strictly capable of being proved by observation, is irresistibly suggested by the most obvious phenomena. Who can believe, for example, that a newborn baby is aware of the necessity of food for preserving life? Or that insects, in laying eggs, are concerned for the preservation of their species? The essence of instinct, one might say, is that it provides a mechanism for acting without foresight in a manner which is usually advantageous, biologically. It is partly for this reason that it is so important to understand the fundamental position of instinct in prompting both animal and human behavior. Lecture 3. Desire and Feeling. Desire is a subject upon which, if I am not mistaken, true views can only be arrived at by an almost complete reversal of the ordinary, unreflecting opinion. It is natural to regard desire as in its essence, an attitude towards something which is imagined, not actual, this. Something is called the end or object of the desire, and is said to be the purpose of any action resulting from the desire. We think of the content of the desire as being just like the content of a belief, while the attitude taken up towards the content is different. According to this theory, when we say, I hope it will rain, or I expect it will rain, we express, in the first case, a desire, and in the second, a belief with an identical content, namely, the image of rain. It would be easy to say that, just as belief is one kind of feeling in relation, to this content, so desire is another kind. According to this view, what comes first in desire is something imagined, with a specific feeling related to it, namely, that specific feeling which we call desiring it. The discomfort associated with unsatisfied desire, and the actions 
which aim at satisfying desire, are, in this view, both of them effects of the desire. I think it is fair to say that this is a view against which common sense would not rebel, nevertheless, I believe it to be radically mistaken. It cannot be refuted logically, but various facts can be adduced which make it gradually less simple and plausible, until at last it turns out to be easier to abandon it wholly and look at the matter in a totally different way. The first set of facts to be adduced against the common sense view of desire are those studied by psychoanalysis in all human beings, but most markedly in those suffering from hysteria and certain forms of insanity, we find what are called unconscious desires, which are commonly regarded as showing self-deception. Most psychoanalysts pay little attention to the analysis of desire, being interested in discovering by observation what it is that people desire, rather than in discovering what actually constitutes desire. I think the strangeness of what they report would be greatly diminished if it were expressed in the language of a behaviorist theory of desire, rather than in the language of everyday beliefs. The general description of the sort of phenomena that bear on our present question is as follows, a person states that his desires are so and so, and that it is these desires that inspire his actions, but the outside observer perceives that his actions are such as to realize quite different ends from those which he avows, and that these different ends are such as he might be expected to desire. Generally they are less virtuous than his professed desires, and are therefore less agreeable to profess than these are. It is accordingly supposed that they really exist as desires for ends, but in a subconscious part of the mind, which the patient refuses to admit into consciousness for fear of having to think ill of himself. There are no doubt many cases to which such a supposition is applicable without obvious artificiality. But the deeper the Freudians delve into the underground regions of instinct, the further they travel from anything resembling conscious desire, and the less possible it becomes to believe that only positive self-deception conceals from us that we really wish for things which are abhorrent to our explicit life. In the cases in question we have a conflict between the outside observer and the patient's consciousness. The whole tendency of psychoanalysis is to trust the outside observer rather than the testimony of introspection. I believe this tendency to be entirely right but to demand a restatement of what constitutes desire, exhibiting it as a causal law of our actions, not as something actually existing in our minds. But let us first get a clearer statement of the essential characteristic of the phenomena. A person, we find, states that he desires a certain end A, and that he is acting with a view to achieving it. We observe, however, that his actions are such as are likely to achieve a quite different end B, and that B is the sort of end that often seems to be aimed at by animals and savages, though civilized people are supposed to have discarded it. We sometimes find also a whole set of false beliefs, of such a kind as to persuade the patient that his actions are really a means to A, when in fact they are a means to B. For example, we have an impulse to inflict pain upon those whom we hate, we therefore believe that they are wicked, and that punishment will reform them. This belief enables us to act upon the impulse to inflict pain, while believing that we are acting upon 
the desire to lead sinners to repentance. It is for this reason that the criminal law has been in all ages more severe than it would have been if the impulse to ameliorate the criminal had been what really inspired it. It seems simple to explain such a state of affairs as due to self-deception, but this explanation is often mythical. Most people, in thinking about punishment, have had no more need to hide their vindictive impulses from themselves than they have had to hide. The exponential theorem. Our impulses are not patent to a casual observation, but are only to be discovered by a scientific study of our actions, in the course of which we must regard ourselves as objectively as we should the motions of the planets or the chemical reactions of a new element. The study of animals reinforces this conclusion, and is in many ways the best preparation for the analysis of desire. In animals we are not troubled by the disturbing influence of ethical considerations. In dealing with human beings, we are perpetually distracted by being told that such and such a view is gloomy or cynical or pessimistic. Ages of human conceit have built up such a vast myth as to our wisdom and virtue that any intrusion of the mere scientific desire to know the facts is instantly resented by those who cling to comfortable illusions. But no, one cares whether animals are virtuous or not, and no one is under the delusion that they are rational. Moreover, we do not expect them to be so conscious, and are prepared to admit that their instincts prompt useful actions without any prevision of the ends which they achieve. For all these reasons, there is much in the analysis of mind which is more easily discovered by the study of animals than by the observation of human beings. We all think that, by watching the behavior of animals, we can discover more or less what they desire. If this is the case and I fully agree, that it is desire must be capable of being exhibited in actions, for it is only the actions of animals that we can observe. They may have minds, in which all sorts of things take place, but we can know nothing about their minds except by means of inferences from their actions, and the more such inferences are examined, the more dubious they appear. It would seem, therefore, that actions alone must be the test of the desires of animals. From this it is an easy step to the conclusion that an animal's desire is nothing but a characteristic of a certain series of actions, namely, those which would be commonly regarded as inspired by the desire in question. And when it has been shown that this view affords a satisfactory account of animal desires, it is not difficult to see that the same explanation is applicable to the desires of human beings. We judge easily from the behavior of an animal of a familiar kind whether it is hungry or thirsty, or pleased or displeased, or inquisitive or terrified. The verification of our judgment, so far, as verification is possible, must be derived from the immediately succeeding actions of the animal. Most people would say that they infer first something about the animal's state of mind whether it is hungry or thirsty and so on and thence derive their expectations as to its subsequent conduct. But this detour through the animal's supposed mind is wholly unnecessary. We can say simply, the animal's behavior during the last minute has had those characteristics which distinguish what is called hunger, and it is likely that its actions during the next minute will be similar in this respect, unless it finds food, or is interrupted by a stronger impulse, such as fear. 
an animal which is hungry is restless, it goes to the places where food is often to be found, it sniffs with its nose or peers with its eyes or otherwise. Increases the sensitiveness of its sense organs, as soon as it is near. Enough to food for its sense organs to be affected, it goes to it with all speed and proceeds to eat, after which, if the quantity of food has been sufficient, its whole demeanor changes it may very likely lie down and go to sleep. These things and others like them are observable. Phenomena distinguishing a hungry animal from one which is not hungry. The characteristic mark by which we recognize a series of actions which display hunger is not the animal's mental state, which we cannot observe, but something in its bodily behavior, it is this observable trait in the bodily behavior that I am proposing to call hunger. Not some possibly mythical and certainly unknowable ingredient of the animal's mind. Generalizing what occurs in the case of hunger, we may say that what we call a desire in an animal is always displayed in a cycle of actions, having certain fairly well-marked characteristics. There is first a state of activity, consisting, with qualifications to be mentioned. Presently, of movements likely to have a certain result, these movements, unless interrupted, continue until the result is achieved, after which there is usually a period of comparative quiescence. A cycle of actions of this sort has marks by which it is broadly distinguished from the motions of dead matter. The most notable of these marks are, 1, the appropriateness of the actions for the realization of a certain result, 2, the continuance of action until that result has been achieved. Neither of these can be pressed beyond a point. Either may be, a, to some extent, present in dead matter, and b to a considerable extent absent in animals, while vegetable or intermediate, and display only a much fainter form of the behavior which leads us to attribute desire to animals, of one might say rivers, desire, the sea water, roughly speaking, remains in restless motion until it reaches either the sea or a place from which it cannot issue without going uphill, and Therefore we might say that this is what it wishes while it is flowing. We do not say so, because we can account for the behavior of water by the laws of physics, and if we knew more about animals, we might equally cease to attribute desires to them, since we might find physical and chemical reactions sufficient to account for their behavior, b. many of the movements of animals do not exhibit the characteristics of the cycles which seem to embody desire. There are first of all the movements, which are mechanical, such as slipping and falling, where ordinary physical forces operate upon the animal's body almost as if it were dead matter. An animal which falls over a cliff may make a number of desperate struggles while it is in the air, but its center of gravity will move exactly as it would if the animal were dead. In this case, if the animal is killed at the end of the fall, we have, at first sight, just the characteristics of a cycle of actions embodying desire, namely, restless movement until the ground is reached, and then quiescence. Nevertheless, we feel no temptation to say that the animal desired what occurred, partly because of the obviously mechanical nature of the whole occurrence, partly because, when an animal survives a fall, it tends not to repeat the experience. There may be other reasons also, but of them I do not wish to speak yet. Besides mechanical movements, there are interrupted movements, as when 
A bird, on its way to eat your best peas, is frightened away by the boy, whom you are employing for that purpose. If interruptions are frequent, and completion of cycles rare, the characteristics by which cycles are observed may become so blurred as to be almost unrecognizable. The result of these various considerations is that the differences between animals and dead matter, when we confine ourselves to external unscientific observation of integral behavior, are a matter of degree, and not very precise. It is for this reason that it has always been possible for fanciful people to maintain that even stocks and stones have some vague kind of soul. The evidence that animals have souls is so very shaky that, if it is assumed to be conclusive, one might just as well go a step further and extend the argument by analogy to all matter. Nevertheless, in spite of vagueness and doubtful cases, the existence of cycles in the behavior of animals is a broad characteristic by which they are prima facie distinguished from ordinary matter, and I think it is this characteristic which leads us to attribute desires to animals, since it makes their behavior resemble what we do when, as we say, we are acting from desire. I shall adopt the following definitions for describing the behavior of animals. A behavior cycle is a series of voluntary or reflex movements of an animal tending to cause a certain result, and continuing until that result is caused, unless they are interrupted by death, accident, or some new behavior cycle. Here, accident may be defined as the intervention of purely physical laws causing mechanical movements. The purpose of a behavior cycle is the result which brings it to an end, normally by a condition of temporary quiescence provided there is no interruption. An animal is said to desire the purpose of a behavior cycle while the behavior cycle is in progress. I believe these definitions to be adequate also to human purposes and desires, but for the present I am only occupied with animals and with what can be learnt by external observation. I am very anxious that no ideas should be attached to the words purpose and desire beyond those involved in the above definitions. We have not so far considered what is the nature of the initial stimulus to a behavior cycle. Yet it is here that the usual view of desire seems on the strongest ground. The hungry animal goes on making movements. Until it gets food, it seems natural, therefore, to suppose that the idea of food is present throughout the process, and that the thought of the end to be achieved sets the whole process in motion. Such a view however, is obviously untenable in many cases, especially where instinct is concerned. Take, for example, reproduction and the rearing of the young. Birds mate, build a nest, lay eggs in it, sit on the eggs, feed the young birds, and care for them until they are fully grown. It is totally impossible to suppose that this series of actions, which constitutes one behavior cycle, is inspired by any prevision of the end, at any rate the first time it is performed. Asterisk we must suppose that the stimulus to the performance of each act is an impulsion from behind, not an attraction from the future. The bird does what it does, at each stage because it has an impulse to that particular action, not because it perceives that the whole cycle of actions will contribute to the preservation of the species. The same considerations apply to other instincts. A hungry animal feels restless and is led by instinctive 
impulses to perform the movements which give it nourishment, but the act of seeking food is not sufficient evidence from which to conclude that the animal has the thought of food in its mind. Asterisk for evidence as to birds' nests, cf. 7, die neem, pp. 209-210. Coming now to human beings, and to what we know about our own actions. It seems clear that what, with us, sets a behavior cycle in motion is some sensation of the sort which we call disagreeable. Take the case of hunger, we have first an uncomfortable feeling inside, producing a disinclination to sit still, a sensitiveness to savory smells, and an attraction towards any food that there may be in our neighborhood. At any moment during this process we may become aware that we are hungry. In the sense of saying to ourselves, I am hungry, but we may have been acting with reference to food for some time before this moment. While we are talking or reading, we may eat in complete unconsciousness, but we perform the actions of eating just as we should if we were conscious. And they cease when our hunger is appeased. What we call consciousness seems to be a mere spectator of the process, even when it issues orders. They are usually, like those of a wise parent, just such as would have been obeyed even if they had not been given. This view may seem at first exaggerated, but the more our so-called volitions and their causes are examined, the more it is forced upon us. The part played by words in all. This is complicated, and a potent source of confusions, I shall return to it later. For the present, I am still concerned with primitive desire, as it exists in man, but in the form in which man shows his affinity to his animal ancestors. Conscious desire is made up partly of what is essential to desire, partly of beliefs as to what we want. It is important to be clear as to the part which does not consist of beliefs. The primitive non-cognitive element in desire seems to be a push, not a pull, an impulsion away from the actual, rather than an attraction towards the ideal. Certain sensations and other mental occurrences have a property which we call discomfort, these cause such bodily movements as are likely to lead to their cessation. When the discomfort ceases, or even when it appreciably diminishes, we have sensations possessing a property which we call pleasure. Pleasurable sensations either stimulate no action at all, or at most stimulate such action as is likely to prolong them. I shall return shortly to the consideration of what discomfort and pleasure are in themselves, for the present, it is. Their connection with action and desire that concerns us. Abandoning momentarily the standpoint of behaviorism, we may presume that hungry animals experience sensations involving discomfort, and stimulating such movements as seem likely to bring them to the food which is outside the cages. When they have reached the food and eaten it, their discomfort ceases and their sensations become pleasurable. It seems, mistakenly, as if the animals had had this situation in mind throughout, when in fact, they have been continually pushed by discomfort. And when an animal is reflective, like some men, it comes to think that it had the final situation in mind throughout, sometimes it comes to know what situation will bring satisfaction, so that in fact the discomfort does bring the thought of what will allay it. Nevertheless the sensation involving discomfort remains the prime mover. This brings us to the question of the nature of discomfort and pleasure. 
Since Kant it has been customary to recognize three great divisions of Mental phenomena, which are typified by knowledge, desire and feeling. Where feeling, is used to mean pleasure and discomfort. Of course. Knowledge, is too definite a word, the states of mind concerned are. Grouped together as cognitive, and are to embrace not only beliefs. But perceptions, doubts, and the understanding of concepts. Desire also, is narrower than what is intended, for example, will is to be included in this category, and in fact everything that involves any kind of striving, or conation, as it is technically called. I do not, myself believe that there is any value in this threefold division of the contents of mind. I believe that sensations, including images, supply all the stuff of the mind, and that everything else can be analyzed into groups of sensations related in various ways, or characteristics of sensations or of groups of sensations. As regards belief, I shall give grounds for this view in later lectures. As regards desires, I have given some grounds in this lecture. For the present, it is pleasure and discomfort that concern us. There are broadly three theories that might be held in regard to them. We may regard them as separate existing items in those who experience them, or we may regard them as intrinsic qualities of sensations and other mental occurrences, or we may regard them as mere names for the causal characteristics of the occurrences, which are uncomfortable or pleasant. The first of these theories, namely, that which regards discomfort and pleasure as actual contents in those who experience them, has, I think, nothing conclusive to be said in its favor. Asterisk it is suggested chiefly by an ambiguity in the word. Pain, which has misled many people, including Berkeley, whom it supplied with one of his arguments for subjective idealism. We may use pain as the opposite of pleasure, and painful as the opposite of pleasant, or we may use pain to mean a certain sort of sensation, on level with the sensations of heat and cold and touch. The latter use of the word has prevailed in psychological literature, and it is now no longer used as the opposite of pleasure. D. R. H. Head, in a recent publication, has stated this distinction as follows, asterisk 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 various arguments in its favor are advanced by A. Wolgamuth, on the feelings and their neural correlate. With an examination of the nature of pain, British Journal of Psychology, v. 4. 1917. But as these arguments are largely a reductio ad absurdum of other theories, among which that which I am advocating is not included, I cannot regard them as establishing their contention. Asterisk, asterisk, sensation and the cerebral cortex, brain, volume XLI. Part E, September, 1918, p. 90. C.F., also Wolgamuth, Locke. Sit p. p. 437, 450. It is necessary at the outset to distinguish clearly between discomfort, and pain. Pain is a distinct sensory quality equivalent to heat and cold, and its intensity can be roughly graded according to the force expended in stimulation. Discomfort, on the other hand, is that feeling tone which is directly opposed to pleasure. It may accompany sensations not in themselves essentially painful, as for Instance that produced by tickling the sole of the foot. The reaction. 
produced by repeated pricking contains both these elements, for it evokes that sensory quality known as pain, accompanied by a disagreeable feeling tone, which we have called discomfort. On the other hand, excessive pressure, except when applied directly over some nerve trunk, tends to excite more discomfort than pain. The confusion between discomfort and pain has made people regard discomfort as a more substantial thing than it is, and this in turn has reacted upon the view taken of pleasure, since discomfort and pleasure are evidently on a level in this respect. As soon as discomfort is clearly distinguished from the sensation of pain, it becomes more Natural to regard discomfort and pleasure as properties of mental occurrences than to regard them as separate mental occurrences on their own account. I shall therefore dismiss the view that they are separate mental occurrences and regard them as properties of such experiences as would be called respectively uncomfortable and pleasant. It remains to be examined whether they are actual qualities of such occurrences, or are merely differences as to causal properties. I do not, myself see any way of deciding this question, either view seems equally capable of accounting for the facts. If this is true, it is safer to avoid the assumption that there are such intrinsic qualities of mental occurrences as are in question, and to assume only the causal differences which are undeniable. Without condemning the intrinsic theory, we can define discomfort and pleasure as consisting in causal properties, and say only what will hold on either of the two theories. Following this course, we shall say. Discomfort is a property of a sensation or other mental occurrence, consisting in the fact that the occurrence in question stimulates voluntary or reflex movements tending to produce some more or less definite change involving the cessation of the occurrence. Pleasure is a property of a sensation or other mental occurrence consisting in the fact that the occurrence in question either does not stimulate any voluntary or reflex movement, or, if it does, stimulates only such as tend to prolong the occurrence in question. Asterisk. Asterisk cf. Thorndike, opposite p. 243. Conscious desire, which we have now to consider, consists of desire. In the sense hitherto discussed, together with a true belief as to its purpose, i.e. as to the state of affairs that will bring quiescence, with cessation of the discomfort. If our theory of desire is correct, a belief as to its purpose may very well be erroneous, since only experience can show what causes a discomfort to cease. When the Experience needed is common and simple, as in the case of hunger, a mistake is not very probable. But in other cases e.g. erotic desire in those who have had little or no experience of its satisfaction mistakes are to be expected, and do in fact very often occur. The practice of Inhibiting impulses, which is to a great extent necessary to civilized life, makes mistakes easier, by preventing experience of the actions to which a desire would otherwise lead, and by often causing the inhibited impulses themselves to be unnoticed or quickly forgotten. The perfectly natural mistakes which thus arise constitute a large proportion of what is mistakenly in part called self-deception and attributed by Freud to the censor. But there is a further point which needs emphasizing, namely, that a belief that something is desired has often a tendency to cause the very desire that is believed in. It is this fact that makes the effect of 
Consciousness on desire so complicated. When we believe that we desire a certain state of affairs, that often tends to cause a real desire for it. This is due partly to the influence of words upon our emotions, in rhetoric for example, and partly to the general fact that discomfort normally belongs to the belief that we desire such and such a thing that we do not possess. Thus what was originally a false opinion as to the object of a desire acquires a certain truth, the false opinion generates a secondary subsidiary desire, which nevertheless becomes real. Let us take an illustration. Suppose you have been jilted in a way which wounds your vanity. Your natural impulsive desire will be of the sort expressed in Don's poem. When by thy scorn, O murderess, I am dead. In which he explains how he will haunt the poor lady as a ghost, and prevent her from enjoying a moment's peace. But two things stand in. The way of your expressing yourself so naturally, on the one hand, your vanity, which will not acknowledge how hard you are hit, on the other hand, your conviction that you are a civilized and humane person, who could not possibly indulge so crude a desire as revenge. You will, therefore, experience a restlessness which will at first seem quite aimless, but will finally resolve itself in a conscious desire to change your profession, or go round the world, or conceal your identity and live in Putney, like Arnold Bennett's hero. Although the prime cause of this desire is a false judgment as to your previous unconscious desire, yet the new conscious desire has its own derivative genuineness, and may influence your actions to the extent of sending you round the world. The initial mistake, however, will have effects of two kinds. First, in uncontrolled moments, under the influence of sleepiness or drink, or delirium, you will say things calculated to injure the faithless deceiver. Secondly, you will find travel disappointing, and the East less fascinating than you had hoped unless, some day, you hear that the wicked one has in turn been jilted. If this happens, you will believe that you feel sincere sympathy, but you will suddenly be much more delighted than before with the beauties of tropical islands or the wonders of Chinese art. A secondary desire, derived from a false Judgment as to a primary desire, has its own power of influencing action, and is therefore a real desire according to our definition. But it has not the same power as a primary desire of bringing thorough satisfaction when it is realized, so long as the primary desire remains. Unsatisfied, restlessness continues in spite of the secondary desires success. Hence arises a belief in the vanity of human wishes, the vain. Wishes are those that are secondary, but mistaken beliefs prevent us from realizing that they are secondary. What may, with some propriety, be called self-deception arises through the operation of desires for beliefs. We desire many things which it is not in our power to achieve that we should be universally popular and admired, that our work should be the wonder of the age, and that the universe should be so ordered as to bring ultimate happiness to all, though not to our enemies until they have repented and been purified by suffering. Such desires are too large to be achieved through our own efforts. But it is found that a considerable portion of the satisfaction which these things would bring us if they were realized is to be achieved by the much easier operation of believing that they are or will be realized. This desire for beliefs, as opposed to desire for the 
Actual facts, is a particular case of secondary desire, and, like all, Secondary desire its satisfaction does not lead to a complete cessation of the initial discomfort. Nevertheless, desire for beliefs, as opposed to desire for facts, is exceedingly potent both individually and socially. According to the form of belief desired, it is called vanity, optimism, or religion. Those who have sufficient power usually imprison or put to death anyone who tries to shake their faith in their own excellence or in that of the universe, it is for this reason that seditious libel and blasphemy have always been, and still are, criminal offenses. It is very largely through desires for beliefs that the primitive Nature of desire has become so hidden, and that the part played by consciousness has been so confusing and so exaggerated. We may now summarize our analysis of desire and feeling. A mental occurrence of any kind sensation, image, belief, or emotion may be a cause of a series of actions, continuing, and less interrupted, until some more or less definite state of affairs is realized. Such a series of actions we call a behavior cycle. The degree of definiteness may vary greatly. Hunger requires only food in general, whereas the sight of a particular piece of food raises a desire, which requires the eating of that piece of food. The property of causing such a cycle of occurrences is called discomfort, the property of the mental occurrences in which the cycle ends is called pleasure. The actions constituting the cycle must not be purely mechanical, i.e. they must be bodily movements in whose causation the special properties of nervous tissue are involved. The cycle ends in a condition of Quiescence, or of such action as tends only to preserve the status quo. The state of affairs in which this condition of quiescence is achieved is called the purpose of the cycle and the initial mental occurrence. Involving discomfort is called a desire for the state of affairs that brings quiescence. A desire is called conscious when it is accompanied by a true belief as to the state of affairs that will bring quiescence. Otherwise it is called unconscious. All primitive desire is unconscious, and in human beings beliefs as to the purposes of desires are often mistaken. These mistaken beliefs generate secondary desires which cause various interesting complications in the psychology of human desire, without fundamentally altering the character which it shares. With animal desire. Lecture IV. Influence of past history on present occurrences in living organisms. In this lecture we shall be concerned with a very general characteristic, which broadly, though not absolutely, distinguishes the behavior of living organisms from that of dead matter. The characteristic in question is this. The response of an organism to a given stimulus is very often dependent upon the past history of the organism and not merely upon the stimulus and the hitherto discoverable present state of the organism. This characteristic is embodied in the saying, a burnt child fears the fire. The burn may have left no visible traces, yet it modifies the reaction of the child in the presence of fire. It is customary to assume that, in such cases, the past operates by modifying the structure of the brain, not directly. I have no wish to suggest that this hypothesis is false, I wish only to point out that it is a hypothesis. At the end of the present lecture I shall examine the grounds in its favor. If we 
confine ourselves to facts which have been actually observed, we must say that past occurrences, in addition to the present stimulus and the present ascertainable condition of the organism, enter into the causation of the response. The characteristic is not wholly confined to living organisms. For example, magnetized steel looks just like steel which has not been magnetized, but its behavior is in some ways different. In the case of dead matter, however, such phenomena are less frequent and important than in the case of living organisms, and it is far less difficult to invent satisfactory hypotheses as to the microscopic changes of structure which mediate between the past occurrence and the present changed response. In the case of living organisms, practically everything that is distinctive both of their physical and of their mental behavior is bound up with this persistent influence of the past. Further, speaking broadly, the change in response is usually of a kind that is biologically advantageous to the organism. Following a suggestion derived from Semen, Dynim, Leipzig, 1904. Second edition, 1908, English translation, Allen and Onwin, 1921, Die. Namission Empfindungen, Leipzig, 1909, we will give the name of mnemic phenomena to those responses of an organism which, so far as hitherto observed facts are concerned, can only be brought under causal laws by including past occurrences in the history of the organism as part of the causes of the present response. I do not mean merely what would always be the case that past occurrences are part of a chain of causes leading to the present event. I mean that, in attempting to state the proximate cause of the present event, some past event or events must be included, unless we take refuge in hypothetical modifications of brain structure. For example, you smell peat smoke, and you recall some occasion when you smelt it before. The cause of your recollection, so far as hitherto observable phenomena are concerned, consists both of the peat smoke present stimulus, and of the former occasion past experience. The same stimulus will not produce the same recollection. In another man who did not share your former experience, although the former experience left no observable traces in the structure of the brain. According to the maxim, same cause, same effect, we cannot therefore regard the peat smoke alone as the cause of your recollection, since it does not have the same effect in other cases. The cause of your recollection must be both the peat smoke and the past occurrence. Accordingly your recollection is an instance of what we are calling mnemic phenomena. Before going further, it will be well to give illustrations of different classes of mnemic phenomena. But acquired habits, in lecture 2 we saw how animals can learn by experience how to get out of cages or mazes, or perform other actions, which are useful to them but not provided for by their instincts alone. A cat which is put into a cage of which it has had experience behaves differently from the way in which it behaved at first. We can easily invent hypotheses, which are quite likely to be true, as to connections in the brain caused by past experience, and themselves causing the different response. But the observable fact is that the stimulus of being in the cage produces differing results with repetition, and that the ascertainable cause of the cat's behavior is not merely the cage, and its own ascertainable organization, 
but also its past history. In regard to the cage, from our present point of view, the matter is independent of the question whether the cat's behavior is due to some mental fact called knowledge or displays a merely bodily habit. Our habitual knowledge is not always in our minds, but is called up by the appropriate stimuli. If we are asked what is the capital of France, we answer Paris, because of past experience, the past experiences is essential is the present question in the causation of our response. Thus, all our habitual knowledge consists of acquired habits, and comes under the head of mnemic phenomena. V. Images, I shall have much to say about images in a later lecture. For the present I am merely concerned with them insofar as they are copies of past sensations. When you hear New York spoken of, some image probably comes into your mind, either of the place itself, if you have been there, or of some picture of it, if you have not. The image is due to your past experience, as well as to the present stimulus of the words, New York. Similarly, the images you have in dreams are all dependent upon your past experience, as well as upon the present. Stimulus to dreaming. It is generally believed that all images, in their simpler parts, are copies of sensations, if so, their mnemic character is evident. This is important, not only on its own account, but also because, as we shall see later, images play an essential part in what is called thinking. See, association, the broad fact of association, on the mental side, is that when we experience something which we have experienced before, it tends to call up the context of the former experience. The smell of Heat smoke recalling a former scene as an instance which we discussed a moment ago. This is obviously a mnemic phenomenon. There is also a more purely physical association, which is indistinguishable from physical habit. This is the kind studied by Mr. Thorndike in animals, where a certain stimulus is associated with a certain act. This is the sort which is taught to soldiers in drilling, for example. In such a case, there need not be anything mental, but merely a habit of the body. There is no essential distinction between association and habit, and the observations which we made concerning habit as a mnemic phenomenon are equally applicable to association. D. Non-sensational elements in perception, when we perceive any object of a familiar kind, much of what appears subjectively to be immediately given is really derived from past experience. When we see an object, say, a penny, we seem to be aware of its real shape. We have the impression of something circular, not of something elliptical. In learning to draw, it is necessary to acquire the art of representing things according to the sensation, not according to the perception. And the visual appearance is filled out with feeling of what the object would be like to touch, and so on. This filling out and supplying of the real shape, and so on, consists of the most usual correlates of the sensational core. In our perception, it may happen that, in the particular case, the real correlates are unusual, for example, if what we are seeing is a carpet made to look like tiles. If so, the non-sensational part of our perception will be illusory, i.e. it will supply qualities which the object in question does not in fact have, but as a rule objects do have the qualities added by perception, which is to be expected. Since experience of what is usual is the cause of the addition, 
If our experience had been different, we should not fill out sensation in the same way, except in so far as the filling out is instinctive, not acquired. It would seem that, in man, all that makes up space. Perception, including the correlation of sight and touch and so on, is almost entirely acquired. In that case there is a large mnemic element. In all the common perceptions by means of which we handle common objects. And, to take another kind of instance, imagine what our Astonishment would be if we were to hear a cat bark or a dog mew. This emotion would be dependent upon past experience, and would therefore be anemic phenomenon according to the definition. E. Memory is knowledge, the kind of memory of which I am now speaking, is definite knowledge of some past event in one's own experience. From time to time we remember things that have happened to us because something in the present reminds us of them. Exactly the same present fact would not call up the same memory if our past experience had been different. Thus our remembering is caused by 1. The present stimulus. 2. The past occurrence. It is therefore anemic phenomenon according to our definition. A. Definition of mnemic phenomena, which did not include memory would, of course, be a bad one. The point of the definition is not that it includes memory, but that it includes it as one of a class of phenomena, which embrace all that is characteristic in the subject matter of psychology. F. Experience. The word experience is often used very vaguely. James, as we saw, uses it to cover the whole primal stuff of the world. But this usage seems objectionable, since, in a purely physical world, things would happen without there being any experience. It is only mnemic phenomena that embody experience. We may say that an animal experiences an occurrence when this occurrence modifies the animal's subsequent behavior, i.e. when it is the mnemic portion of the cause of future occurrences in the animal's life. The burnt child that fears the fire has experienced the fire, whereas a stick that has been thrown on and taken off again has not experienced anything, since it offers no more resistance than before to being thrown on. The essence of experience is the modification of behavior produced by what is experienced. We might, in fact, define one chain of experience, or one biography, as a series of occurrences linked by mnemic causation. I think it is this characteristic, more than any other, that distinguishes sciences dealing with living organisms from physics. The best writer on mnemic phenomena known to me is Richard Semon, the fundamental part of whose theory I shall endeavor to summarize before going further. When an organism, either animal or plant, is subjected to a stimulus, producing in it some state of excitement, the removal of the stimulus allows it to return to a condition of equilibrium. But the new state of equilibrium is different from the old, as may be seen by the change. Capacity for reaction. The state of equilibrium before the stimulus may be called the primary indifferent state that after the cessation of the stimulus, the secondary indifferent state. We define the engraphic effect of a stimulus as the effect in making a difference between the primary and secondary indifferent states, and this difference itself we define as the engram due to the stimulus. Mnemic phenomena are defined as those due to engrams. In animals, they are specially associated with the nervous system, but not exclusively, even 
in man. When two stimuli occur together, one of them, occurring afterwards, may call out the reaction for the other also. We call this an ekphoric influence, and stimuli having this character are called ekphoric stimuli. In such a case we call the engrams of the two stimuli associated. All simultaneously generated engrams are associated, there is also association of successively aroused engrams, though this is reducible to simultaneous association. In fact, it is not an isolated stimulus that leaves an engram, but the totality of the stimuli at any moment, consequently any portion of this totality tends, if it recurs, to arouse the whole reaction which was aroused before. Semon holds that engrams can be inherited, and that an animal's innate habits may be due to the experience of its ancestors, on this subject he refers to Samuel Butler. Semon formulates two mnemic principles. The first, or law of engraphy, is as follows, all simultaneous excitements in an organism form a connected simultaneous excitement complex, which is such works. Engraphically, i.e. leaves behind a connected engram complex, which insofar forms a whole dynamischen Empfindungen p. 146. The second mnemic principle, or law of ekphory, is as follows. The partial return of the energetic situation which formerly worked. Engraphically operates ekphorically on a simultaneous engram complex. I. V. P. 173. These two laws together represent in part a hypothesis. The engram, and in part an observable fact. The observable fact is, that, when a certain complex of stimuli has originally caused a certain complex of reactions, the recurrence of part of the stimuli tends to cause the recurrence of the whole of the reactions. Semon's applications of his fundamental ideas in various directions are interesting and ingenious. Some of them will concern us later, but for the present it is the fundamental character of mnemic phenomena that is in question. Concerning the nature of an engram, Semon confesses that at present it is impossible to say more than that it must consist in some material alteration in the body of the organism Dynamischen Empfindungen. P. 376. It is, in fact, hypothetical, invoked for theoretical uses, and not an outcome of direct observation. No doubt physiology, especially the disturbances of memory through lesions in the brain, affords grounds for this hypothesis, nevertheless it does remain a hypothesis, the validity of which will be discussed at the end of this lecture. I am inclined to think that, in the present state of physiology, the Introduction of the engram does not serve to simplify the account of mnemic phenomena. We can, I think, formulate the known laws of such phenomena in terms, wholly, of observable facts, by recognizing provisionally what we may call mnemic causation. By this I mean that kind of causation of which I spoke at the beginning of this lecture. That kind, namely, in which the proximate cause consists not merely of a present event, but of this together with a past event. I do not wish to urge that this form of causation is ultimate, but that, in the present, 